Hi everybody and welcome back to Room 9, our region's largest classroom. My name is Miss St. Louis and I'm a teacher at Rogers Elementary School in the Melville School District and we are located in South St. Louis County. Today I'm here to teach a reading lesson that's geared towards students who are in the third grade but all learners are more than welcome to join and explore with us. So let's get started. This week we are talking all about comprehension of books. So comprehension is the process of a reader making meaning of a text. So yesterday we kind of talked about how comprehension is really important, just as important as being able to read the words in a text. Because it's awesome if you can read all the words in a text, but if you don't know what they mean, it's kind of silly to read the book in the first place, right? When we read, we read for meaning. We read to learn. We read to enjoy. We read directions on how to get places, right? We read ingredients and uh, on how to make things. There's a reason why we're reading something. It's not just about reading the words in a book. It's also about making sense of why we're reading those books, right? And that is what comprehension is all about. So today I want to talk to you about something that really good readers do as they're reading to help them comprehend. And that, oh, missing my poster, is visualization. Visualizing is using your five senses to create a movie picture or picture in your mind and connecting what you're reading with the images. So we've got to think about our five senses. What are our five senses? Oh yes, hearing, right? Our sense of hearing, right? What we're listening to, sounds that are being made, things that our people are saying. Yes, what else do we have? Oh yes, sight, right? What we're seeing, right? The visions and images that we can see, absolutely. Smell, yes, the scents that are going on. Ooh, taste, absolutely. Taste is really a, a really important one. And touch, yes, how things feel. So those senses are really important because it can really help us to visualize or picture what's going on in a book, right? It's almost like making this mental movie in your brain. And sometimes I close my eyes and I try and picture what's going on in the book, right? And so some things that we often make visualizations of are what characters look like, right? When we're reading books, especially chapter books, there aren't always pictures associated with the books. Some don't even have any pictures at all. So we have to come up with these own images in our head of what the characters look like or what the setting looks like, right? Those are some of the big things that we make visualizations of. We can also make visualizations of what's happening, or if we are reading a recipe, we might make a visualization of how something tastes, right? Or during an event that's happening in a book, we might visualize how does it sound, right? What's going on there? If we are reading a book about a sports game, right? Maybe they're at a baseball game. We might be able to hear what the crowd sounds like and what's going on and maybe hear the vendors shouting to sell hot dogs and cotton candy and hear an announcer announcing things and hear the cheering of the crowd and the players talking. Right? There's so many sounds going on that you can really start to picture it in your head and kind of create that mental movie of what's going on. So today, we're going to practice a little visualization and then we're going to practice while we read a book. So, I want you to start by closing your eyes. Or you can leave them open if you like. For me, it's helpful to close my eyes because it can really build that picture. And I'm going to read to you a little paragraph, it's a couple sentences, and I want you to really picture in your mind what I'm talking to you about. So today, first, I'm going to describe a character to you. They want you to create a mental image of this character. Are you ready? Okay. Jack the Rabbit was a tiny, fluffy white rabbit who made a little 
little squeaky noises. His thick fur almost reached the height of his big ears. His little nose bounced up and down with excitement when he saw his new friends. Can you picture, picture our little rabbit in your mind? So big and fluffy. I can almost imagine what it would be like to touch him, right? I know we didn't talk about what it would be like to touch him and what I read, but I can almost picture my hands just touching his fur and just sinking into his fur, right? It's so soft because it's so thick. There's so much of it. He's probably very soft, right, and cuddly. I can picture his little pink nose bobbing up and down. Right? Were you able to make a little mental movie in your mind? Absolutely. All right, let's try another one. Okay. While on a great fishing trip, Jack's family got on a boat to go catch some salmon. As he was looking out into the ocean, he noticed a huge shark fin swimming their way fast. Can you picture that in your mind? Just picture looking out into this ocean, knowing that you're out there to catch some fish and all of a sudden, there in the middle of the ocean, you see something and you're probably wondering, that is and next thing you know you realize it's a shark fin right and it's coming right for your boat right you can almost imagine what the feelings would be like right whether they would be excited or scared or nervous right you can kind of feel almost what the feelings would be like of those characters on the boat all right let's do one more all right Susie looked out the window at the great thunderstorm. She saw a flash of lightning and quickly heard the roar of thunder, followed by the beating wind against the windows. Can you visualize that event? Absolutely. You know, this is almost kind of where our schema can start to come to kind of come into play. And schema is all of that information that we've gathered from either things that we've learned or our personal experiences. And I know that many of us have probably been through a thunderstorm or two in our lives. And so we can take what we already know from a thunderstorm, right? And what it sounds like in a thunderstorm, right? listening to the wind and the we know what thunder sounds like and we've seen cracks of lightning and that can help us to create that visualization right drawing on our own personal experiences and what we already know okay so in certain situations like this when characters are going through um, situations that we ourselves have gone through like a thunderstorm we can use our schema to help build that mental picture okay and even if this story hadn't given us some of those words like the crack, right? To imagine what it sounded like or the roar of the thunder. We can almost fill in the gaps in that situation and really start to hear the sounds ourselves, right? So if all it said was that our character was going through a really bad thunderstorm, in the visualization process, we can start to build that picture through our own schema of what we already know. Now, the more details that an author has, the better our mental picture becomes, right? Because if I just told you there's a fluffy rabbit, your rabbit might be white and my rabbit might be black. And somebody else's might be brown and someone else's might have spots, right? They could all look different. But the, so the more details we get in stories, the more it helps us to really visualize 
what's going on. But that doesn't mean that we can't already use the information we know to help us build our mental pictures. So today, what I would like for us to do is to read a book together and we're gonna practice visualizing some of the events and things that happen in this book. All right, so the book that we're going to read today is called Pa Jingle Bob, The Fastest Knitter in the West by Mary Arrigan and Corky Paul. And it says on the back, when not nice Nellie and her bandits hit the town of Buckaroo, Jemima begins to wish her gentle Pa had not been made sheriff. But at least Pa Jingle Bob is the fastest knitter in the West. Um, you know, I'm kind of wondering how being a fast knitter is going to help him when bandits come to town. Huh. Well, I don't know that that's a useful skill in this situation, but we'll have to keep reading to find out. All right. Let's see what's going on here with Pa and Jingle Bob. Darn dust. Darn dust brings fleas, makes carpets all scratchy, gets in our hair. Jemima Jingle Bob lived in the town of Buckaroo, way out in the Wild West. Nothing much ever happened in Buckaroo. In fact, the only thing the people of Buckaroo ever complained about was the dust that blew in from the desert. Darn dust, they say. It makes our town right dirty. Hmm. Wow. Well. Now I'm thinking, I don't feel like I've ever really been in a really bad dust storm. We don't get a ton of bad dust storms here in Missouri, do we? But... If maybe you've ever been to the deserts, right? Places like Arizona or Nevada, been out there when they've had some bad dust storms, you might be able to pull on some of your schema to help you. But I'm kind of thinking, hmm, I've seen some dust storms from some movies, some TV shows. And so I'm thinking about big waves of dust and everything's got dirt on it. So if I ran my finger across it, it would just come up dirty. Hmm, kind of starting to picture. Lots of dirt everywhere, right? Probably do have to do a lot of sweeping. People might sneeze or cough a lot because there's dust in the air. Hmm, really starting to create a picture of this town in my head. Jemima Jingle Bob's pa was big. He was as broad as a brick wall and hairier than a buffalo. His skin was rougher than old iron. Ooh. Ooh. Can you start to make a picture of Pa in your mind? So he's broad as a brick wall, right? That means he's thick, right? And he's hairier than a buffalo, so he's got lots of hair on him. So I'm picking a picture of a mustache. He's got a beard, right? He's got, his skin is rougher than an old iron. Oof, so he's probably got some calluses, right? Calluses are kind of when your, your skin's thick on your hands, maybe from doing some hard work. It says he's strong as an ox. So he's probably, probably got lots of big muscles, right? Ooh, his hands are like shovels. So he's probably got big hands, right? That can dig things. And his neck is as, ooh, this is the horse saying this. His neck is as thick as my rump, right? So you got a big neck. So you can definitely start to create a picture. Now, this book is helpful because it also has pictures with it, right? But remember, not every book has that. Hmm. Well, my picture's kind of close to what he looks like. I'm picturing him more with a beard. He doesn't have much of a beard in this picture. But that's what I picture Paul with, with a big old beard. Jemima wished her pa would go hunting for bears and shoot holes in ace cards. She wished he would round up mean outlaws who wore muddy boots and had no manners. She wished he would do all the things that rootin' tootin' men of the West did. But no, Pa Jingle Bob wasn't interested in any of those things. Pa Jingle Bob liked to knit. He knit the finest woolly sweaters in the West. Now there's a thing to dazzle. Hmm. Hmm, I'm trying to imagine. 
imagine what those sweaters must feel like. Do you think they're soft or are they the itchy kind of sweaters? I wonder. Day after day, he rocked back and forth on the porch in his big wooden rocker, knitting. Oh, I can picture that. Sitting on the porch, rocking back and forth. Knitting away. Jemima wished the people of Buckaroo would stop snickering whenever they passed by and saw him. But pot in mind, one plain, one pearl, he'd say. Jemima sighed and went out to practice lassoing bo the boys who jeered a paw. She's good. She's darn good. One day, a shout went up from the town lookout. There's a horse coming in, he roared. He's a galloping and a sweating. Probably moving really fast, coming in, right? And I know the town's dirty, so there's probably a bunch of dust behind him. I'm picturing this horse coming in, a big dust coming behind him as he's coming in super fast, leaving a trail behind him. Oh, I can picture that. Everyone ran to see. The sweaty rider jumped off his horse. He took a mouthful of water from the horse's trough and spat it out. Ew, gross. There's trouble a-coming, folks, he said. Not nice, Nellie and her bandits are headed this way. Everyone gasped. <gasps> Not nice, Nellie. We've got to have a sheriff, said the mayor, who didn't want to be in charge when Not Nice Nellie hit the town. We need a sheriff who will throw that dame in the clink. Who would like to be sheriff? The townspeople looked at their feet and began to mutter. Miss Grace, the saloon keeper, was busy. I have to squash some lemonades for the uh, some lemons for the lemonade. She can't do it. The undertaker was busy. I'll be busy in digging holes. All the cowboys were busy. We've got to wash our hair. Somebody has to be sheriff, wailed the mayor. We have we can't have bandits coming out here willy nilly and no sheriff to put the manners on them. I'll do it, said Pa Jingle Bob. I'll be sheriff. Phew! Everyone laughed. What a joke! A sheriff who knits woolly sweaters? But the mayor was so relieved that he immediately pinned the sheriff's star on Pa. Okay, Pa Jingle Bob, he said. You're officially sheriff. Now excuse me. I have to see uh, something in my closet. Jemima's heart was nearly burst with pride when she looked at her Pa's badge. That's my brave Pa. Bandits and Buckaroo. It wasn't long before the hooves were heard thundering in the distance. Get your gun, Sheriff, shouted everyone before running into their houses to hide. No need for guns, said Sheriff Jingle Bob, wiping the dust off his new badge with his woolly sleeve. But, Pa, you must use your gun, said Jemima. You are the Sheriff, and that's what Sheriffs do. Pa shook his head and tucked his knitting into his pocket. Guns are for cowards, he said. I ain't afraid of a bunch of gun-toting cowards. But even he had to admit that not nice Nellie was the most fearsome person he had ever seen. She galloped into town shooting or shouting loudly and shooting at passing clouds with her noisy rifle. Come on out! Get out here, you mean bunch of cowards, she screamed. You're all knocked down every house and grind your miserable domes to dust. Such a, scared of such a loud lady, the townspeople crawled up from under their stairs and hide inside their closets. Do something, Sheriff, they muttered. Do something, Pa, said Jemima. Grind down our bones. How would they get about? Before you had time to think, not nice Nellie and her hollering bandits had rounded everyone up. Get down that hole, she said, pointing to the dried up old well at the edge of the town. Are your manners. Now look here, my good woman, said Miss Grace, who kept her husband's saloon neat and tidy and smelling of lavender polish. Mm, can you smell that? It smells like flowers. You can't just dump a whole town full of people in a hole. Oh yeah? Snarled not nice Nellie. Watch me. With that, she and her bandits pushed everyone into the smelly dried up well. Jemima felt her cheeks and ears blush with shame when folks began to grumble at Pa. Might as well have elected a grizzly bear, said the mayor. 
Jemima stamped her foot and frowned. Don't you mind them paws, said Jemima. I think you're terrific. Pa smiled and took out his knitting. One plain, one pearl, he said. Oh, Pa, groaned Jemima. Oh, picturing them being down in that well. Probably doesn't smell too good. They're probably all squished together. Ooh. It's dark, too, I'm guessing. Well, by now, it was dark. All that could be heard was the noisy shouting and laughing of Not Nice Nellie and her bandits as they raided the town. That and the click click of Pa's knitting, needle, knitting needles as he knitted one plain, one pearl. People were quiet, mainly because Jemima had promised to flatten the next person who said one word about her pa. Listen to that, gasped Miss Brown, the school teacher. They're smashing the desks in the schoolroom. Great, said 20 young voices in the dark. Now they're taking the corks out of my lemonade, said Miss Grace. Listen to those corks pop. Oh, can you hear it? Those rotten varmints, said the same 20 voices. Whew, I can hear it. Hear all the noises. It's all Pa, pa Jingle Bob's fault, muttered someone in the corner. A decent sheriff would have clapped. Not nice Nellie in the clink. I told you not to say bad things about my pa, said Jemima. One plain, one pearl. Now the moon was shining in the old well. It lit up the faces of the folks of Buckaroo who were huddled, scared, and cold. It lit up the flash of Pa Jingle Bob's knitting needles. Ooh, I can see them flashing in the dark. It lit up the frown on Jemima's face. There, all done, said Pa Jingle Bob, snapping the wool with his great big teeth. What's all done? asked Jemima. Another hairy old sweater? Nope, said Pa. Then he shook out the thing he had been knitting. There was a loud gasp of amazement. A ladder, people cried. Pa Jingle Bob's gone and knitted us a ladder. Time to teach not nice Nellie and her bunch a lesson, said Pa. He handed Jemima to the top of the ladder. Tie this to the tree, honey bun, he said, and he threw his little daughter right out of the old well. As she tied the woolly ladder to the tree, Jemima could hear the bandits hooting and hollering. Pa will fix y'all, she said to herself. Puffing and panting, Pa Jingle Bob hauled himself up the ladder. Then he did a very strange thing. Hey, shouted the mayor. Why are you pulling up the ladder, Sheriff Jingle Bob? You get in my way, Pop Jingle Bob yelled back. Uh-oh, where is he going? By the light of the moon, Jemima and her pa crept into town, where the sight met their eyes. There in the saloon, drinking every last drop of lemonade, sat not nice Nellie and her bandits. And what a noise they were making, dancing on tables and belching rudely without even saying excuse me. Ooh, I can hear lots of feet stamping, right? We can hear people belching in the background. On the floor were the two big bags with the word loot printed on them. They've stolen all the cash in town, said Pa. Now that's real bad. That, there was worse. On the picture of the mayor, there were squashed tomatoes where his eyes should have been. On the stairs, four of the bandits were having a pillow fight. The feathers from the ripped pillows stuck to everything, especially the broken eggs that dripped down from the wall. Ooh, it is so gross in there right now. Not nice Nellie was throwing half-eaten sausages in the air and shooting them. How can anyone do that to Miss Grace's homemade sausages, gasped Jemima. These are dangerous people, said Pa. Then he smiled and took out his knitting needles. I have a plan, he said. Listen up, sweet Jemima. A little while later, Jemima and Jingle Bob crawled under the swing doors of the saloon. None of the bandits noticed the small girl. They were too busy messing up Miss Grace's good saloon. Jemima frowned her deepest frown and stamped her foot. Get your hands up, she said. Nothing, nobody heard. They just went on with their rip-roaring fun. I said, put your hands up, Jemima roared. The noise stopped. The bandits turned to see who was given orders. How they howled when they saw little Jemima standing with her hands on her hips. Get down from Miss Grace's polished tables, you scruffy varmints, growled Jemima, and come quietly. For five whole minutes, the bandits laughed. Wiping the tears of laughter from her eyes, not nice Nellie peered at Jemima. Uh, say, kid, she said, who knitted your sweater? My pa knitted it, replied Jemima. Her pa knitted it? How the bandits laughed again. Who's your pa? asked not nice Nellie when she could catch her breath. He's the sheriff, 
said Jemima proudly. And we're gonna stop there. So, if you ever get a chance, I suggest checking out the rest of this book from the library to see what Pa Jingabob is up to and how he's gonna use his knitting to help out with uh, not nice Nellie and her scruffy group. But boys and girls, the point of today's lesson was to practice right visualizing, creating that mental movie or picture in your mind. And we were able to do that by thinking about sounds or smells, thinking about the sights of the dust as it came in, right? Picturing how some of our characters looked in our setting. And that's definitely something that good readers do, right? As you're reading text, you really want to be picturing what's going on in the book and what does that look like, right? Because when we read, we can start to really use the adjectives that authors use, right? To really help create those mental pictures in our mind. So as you're reading your next book, I challenge you to go through and see, hmm, what can I visualize here? What can I kind of see what's going on and what kind of pictures can I make? And if you want to take it a step further, draw a picture of what you were reading, right? Draw a picture of the character in the book. Draw a picture of the setting, right? To really help bring those words to life. So boys and girls, I hope that you enjoyed our lesson today, talking all about visualization to help our comprehension. And I hope that you'll join us again tomorrow as we dive in to, to talk even more about comprehending our text. Bye everyone, have a great night. Teaching in Room 9 is made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.